I wanted to start by focusing on today's first reading from the book of Genesis. We're now in chapter two of the book of Genesis. And what's interesting is that we once again have an account of creation, but it's very different from the account that we had in chapter one of the book of Genesis. So in chapter one, man, human beings are the last beings created. But in today's account of creation, man is first created and it says that he doesn't have a helper uh, as a partner, and so God forms every animal of the field and every bird and brings them to the man to see what he would call them. But then it mentions that even then, he, there is not one that is found as a helper, as a suitable helper for man. And so the whole point is that, you know, I had mentioned that the Bible is not a scientific textbook. Once again, this passage proves that because it's somewhat contrary in order to what the first account was. So in the first account, man is the last being created. In this account, man is the first being created. And it's a reminder to us that when God intended to create human beings, that he, he had this idea first. In other words, there's a logical priority to God wanting to create beings to share his glory and his happiness with. And, you know, we heard that man was created in the image and likeness of God. Well, God is pure spirit, so obviously that refers to the spiritual part of man. And so God has this idea to create um, a being that can share in his glory. So there's the angelic beings, but then there's the human beings who are a composite of soul and body. But then God decides, okay, so that, that's the, the um, primary logically, but then, okay, well, where is this man going to reside? Where are human beings going to reside? So then God, you know, logically, it's, it's secondary that, okay, I'll, I'll make a planet for them, I'll make the universe for them, I'll give them animals and plants and all these other things. So in other words, man is the apex or the highest part of creation, and all of creation is intended for man. And this is why when the animals are brought to him, Adam names them, he understands the nature of them, but they're all intended for man, for the benefit of man doesn't mean that we should abuse animals or can do whatever we want with them. We should respect uh, creation and the beauty of creation. But then we come to the creation of Eve. And it's interesting how it mentions that God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and op God, uh, God opens his side and removes a rib and from that rib Eve is formed. And as I mentioned before, there's many foreshadowings in the Old Testament of things that are to come later on that are, in one sense, more perfectly fulfilled later on. So this deep sleep of Adam, now if you recall, St. Paul refers to Christ as the second Adam. And the deep sleep fell upon the second Adam as he hung upon the cross. In other words, the sleep of death. And his side was also opened not by God, but by a spear. And blood and water flowed out, symbolizing the life-giving sacraments of the church, in particular baptism and the Eucharist, but symbolizing the church itself, which is the bride of Christ, as St. Paul tells us. So this, this uh, imagery that we have in the book of Genesis is a foreshadowing, is a, is a symbol of what would come later with Christ, the second Adam, and his bride, the church. But um, Jewish scholars, when they comment on this passage of scripture from the book of Genesis, you know, they, they point out that God didn't take a bone from, man, from Adam's foot or, or from his head. In other words, if, if, if a bone was taken from his foot, it would imply that man is to rule over um, woman. And if it was taken from his head, it would indicate that the woman is to rule over, over the man, over Adam. But it's rather it's taken from his side, from one of his ribs. In other words, something very close to his heart, indicating that man should love woman. 
and, and of course we see uh, the mention of marriage also in today's gospel reading that the two become one flesh, one organic whole, that whatever one does is for the good of both of them and vice versa. And there have been some commentators, um, including St. John Paul II, who point out that man by himself, as indicated in today's scripture reading, is not fulfilled. Man cannot be fulfilled in and of himself. Man is a social being, just like God is a social being. He's a trinity of persons. Recall how it mentions, let us make man in our image and likeness. It's plural. So the trinity of persons. So, you know, imagine if you were a human being and you lived in this world, but there were no other human beings at all. You had nobody that you could talk to, nobody that you could share your feelings or your ideas with, nobody that you could complain to, nobody that you could tell of your hurts or ailments. Now, you know, there's a saying that dogs are man's best friend. And, you know, the reason for that is because pets are often, especially dogs, are often very loyal, very loving, especially if you treat them well. You know, some people probably abuse their pets. I don't know. But uh, there's this saying that, man, that dogs are man's best friend. And, you know, the, 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 the reason for saying that is because of the loyalty that dogs show to their masters, to their owners. But there's more that's required for friendship. And, you know, with, with a dog, yes, they're great companions in many ways, but it's not enough. It's not enough simply to have a dog. I know there's as human beings, we need to, we need to convey information. We need to have information conveyed to us. We need to be able to open up and we want to be able to talk to someone who understands, you know, sometimes dogs might understand that we're in a bad mood or something, but they can't understand our feelings. You know, I, I spoke about how some false scientists believe that eventually machines will have or computers will have a consciousness. You know, they can program a computer to say, oh, I am a computer. But a computer will never understand what that means, what that really means. You can program it to say, oh, well, a computer is just a machine made up of resistors and components and all kinds of uh, component parts, but it, it won't understand. A machine cannot, cannot have understanding. It can convey information, it can store information, it can have all kinds of programs, but it doesn't have understanding. So animals don't have the kind of understanding that we as human beings can and do have. And we need this, this interaction with human beings. And, um, you know, when we think of, of man and woman, as I mentioned, um, you know, Adam or, or Eve, rather, is taken from the rib of Adam. And it also implies the complementarity of the sexes. And once again, the two sexes, male and female. And as I mentioned, soon it will be illegal to, to say that. It, it's, it's certainly politically incorrect right now. And in fact, there was a, an article in the Toronto Sun yesterday and I think it was also in the National Post, but um, uh, I may have missed that. But anyways, um, a student in, in Renfrew, high school student in Renfrew, which is just about an hour from Ottawa, he was suspended by his school because he said there are only two genders. And this occurred uh, while they were having a discussion in class about transgenderism and all these things. And the students, including the teacher, could give whatever opinion they wanted. It didn't matter. But if you said that there are two genders and only two genders, well, that is criminal. That is evil. That is inconsiderate of those who consider themselves to be other genders. And so the student got in trouble. He was suspended. He wasn't permitted to uh, even set foot on, on the school property. And recently he returned to the school for some reason and he was met by the vice principal and they called the police and he was arrested because he believes that there are only two genders. Now, granted, he was suspended, so in one sense, he wasn't supposed to be there. But this is what's happening, and this is in a Catholic school called St. Joseph's Catholic School. And, you know, and most parents have no idea what's going on in the Catholic school systems. 
You know, it's very similar to what's going on in the public schools. And, you know, even here, we have one of our prisoners, uh, Michael Del Grande, you know, and he's fighting a court battle because he wasn't in favor of, uh, you know, uh, allowing the LGBT, um, you know, um, groups to, to exist in the schools. He spoke out against this. And so they want to get him. They want to get rid of him. They want to make an example of him. And, you know, and if you read what's going on, in so many schools, they have these drag queen uh, story hours where these men dressed up as women come in you know with with wild looking hair and all different colors and um, you know red lipstick and, and makeup and, and to teach these young very young children about transgenderism and basically what they're doing is they're you know they're uh, they're, um, they're you know, what's the word you know they're they're um, it's their propaganda they're 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 um, you know, teaching these children, indoctrinating these children, and in many ways they're kind of forming these children to become the way they want them to become and to think the way they want them to think. And what are Catholic parents doing? Nothing. Are they even aware of these things? No, they're not. So it's, it's, it's terrible what's happening. And this is why I'm telling you, you have to read uh, alternative news sources. You can't just rely on mainstream media. So this is happening all over the place. And, and it's very, very unfortunate. It's happening here in, at home. And eventually, even as priests, you know, if, if we post a homily and it says, oh, there's only two genders, it'll be blocked. It'll be banned. And I may be arrested for saying that. This is what it's going to come to. It's just a matter of time. So these people are the minority, but they're very, very vocal, and the government supports them, which is very unfortunate. And most Catholics, they don't care. Same as with abortion. You know, we have the life chain, only about 100 people come out. You know, we have way more parishioners than that. We need more people. We need more people to stand up and vote for politicians who truly care about us as human beings. You know, I mentioned, you know, um, children who are encouraged and, and to, to undergo a transformation from male to female or, or from female to male. And, and, you know, they don't even have to tell the parents that they're giving them hormone blockers and things like that. This is a hu huge abuse of children. And people don't care. They don't realize what's going on. Oh, it doesn't matter. Let them think whatever they want. Think if you want to think you're a cat, that's okay. But anyways, there's the there's the two sexes, and and you know the the uh, so God created the male and the female. But we need social interaction, and it's a reminder to us that you know it doesn't matter how much possessions you have. We need to have good relationships. So just because a person is married doesn't mean they have a good relationship. You need to work at that relationship. We need to have friends. We need to socialize. We need to connect with people. We need to receive information. But, you know, it's not enough just to be texting people. You know, children today have way more psychological problems than ever before. There's many reasons for that. The breakup of the family unit, having both parents work. So they're not, um, you know, receiving the, the nurturing and the care from, from either parent, you know, as they grew up. They're, they're basically raised by the state. And this was a communist thing. The communists are the ones who introduced daycare. In other words, take the children away from the parents as soon as you can to have the state raise and indoctrinate your children so that they won't follow the example of their parents. And we see this happening, especially when we see that the children, youth, tend to rebel against the church, the authority of the church. You know, sometimes I, I preach on these things, and, and there are some young, young students who come to Mass because their parents kind of force them, but, but they give me a dirty look very often when I preach about abortion or, and things like that. So this is the mentality of the youth today, because they've been brainwashed. And this is why so often I bring up scientific facts, because nothing else is going to convince young people. They trust in science, but as I mentioned, there's a false scientists or scientists that are promoting their own agenda and using their own calculations to try to prove or support their arguments for, for whatever they want to promote. So it's very, very unfortunate. And um, we, need to, we need to speak out. We need to be more vocal. I want, so, so we need this human interaction. Basically, we need love. God created us for love. We are social beings, and, and it's only when we have love in our lives, when we are loved and love in return, that we can find true fulfillment. 
texting somebody is not an act of love. You need to interact, and, and by love I don't mean uh, having sex. So truly caring about another person, desiring what is best for them, which also entails speaking the truth to them, speaking the truth to them, not perverting them or, or their understanding of, of reality. The reality is that you're either a male or a female. Yes, sometimes there are biological uh, things that happen and somebody might be messed up genetically, but that is extremely rare, extremely rare. Now, in today's gospel reading, we have this Syrophoenician woman coming to our Lord, begging that our Lord cast out the demon possessing her daughter. And initially, our Lord doesn't want to, but, um, you know, our Lord says... Um, let the children be fed first, in other words, the, the Israelites, the Jewish people, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. In other words, it won't be appreciated by the dogs the way that it is by children. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. In other words, even the dogs appreciate those tiny crumbs. And basically, there's a very important message here. So when we consider the this Syrophoenician woman or others like her, and others, the Gentile nations, well, they had little crumbs of the truth. And um, St. Justin Martyr, he says that God planted, you know, the seeds of faith in, in the other religions of the world. In other words, there's always some good, some truth in these other religions. That's why religions appeal to people in general. So even today, some people become this religion or that religion or, or Buddhist or whatever, right? Because there's always some good, some truth in these faiths. So this woman is saying, well, even the tiny thing that we have, even the tiny bit of faith or articles of faith that we believe in, well, we treasure that, we value that. And it's a good reminder to us, you know, think of, of non-Catholic Christians, Protestants, you know, their principle is sola scriptura, which is Latin for only the Bible. And in other words, they reject tradition. They reject the constant teaching of the church. They don't have the hierarchy of the church. They don't have papal infallibility. In other words, when they have some moral dilemma, it's like they don't know what to do. They don't have the sacraments. They don't have the mass. They don't have the Eucharist. They don't have daily mass. They don't have the rosary. They don't have the devotion to the saints, the intercession of the saints. They are deprived of so many things. And yet, many non-Catholic Christians, many Protestants, are better Christians than most Catholics. And that's a reality. Why? Because they read their Bible. They have that little bit, just the Bible. They read their Bible, and they try to live what the Bible teaches. Whereas for many Catholics, it's just, I go to church, I recite my rosary, I tick it off, I'm done. But for the rest of the time, I live just like everyone else. And that's wrong. And so it's not surprising that we see in our Catholic school systems that they're just like other school systems, like the public school system. Because the teachers and, and the people running it are, well, they're just like everyone else, just like typical Catholics. So we need to, we need to make more of an effort to be truly Christian and to live as Christians because we have the fullness of revelation. We have all the means necessary for salvation, but we tend to take it for granted. We don't appreciate it as much as we should. In other words, the dogs appreciate the, the crumbs. This Syrophoenician woman appreciates the little bit that she has of faith, you know, in the true God or whatever. Well, we need to appreciate every aspect of our faith and we need to live it to the full.